Our speaker this afternoon will be Professor Rebecca Chan on the topic of, Is Faith Good For Me? I'm delighted that Professor Chan is joining us today for two reasons. First, uh, she's an interesting and up-and-coming philosopher who I predict will be someone to watch. Uh, she received her bachelor degree in philosophy from Boston University, her MA from University of Colorado, and like so many other great philosophers before her, received her PhD in philosophy from Notre Dame. Uh, since 2017, she's taught in the philosophy department at San Jose State University. Unlike lots of philosophers, though, she has a law degree, also from Colorado. She works in philosophy of law, but also, especially, um, in metaphysics and metaethics in what she calls normativity-driven metaphysics, which um, I think translated means um, that part of philosophy that has to do with persons and what they ought to do. She has a book manuscript uh, in process on this very topic, along with papers and reviews published or accepted in Notre Dame Philosophical Review, Faith and Philosophy, Oxford Studies in Philosophy Religion, and Race Philosophica. She's also got paper drafts on everything from Jean-Paul Sartre and metaphysics of essences to the issue of indulgences, the nature of transformative religious experience, and the problem of evil in sports. Uh, so that's the first reason, interesting stuff. Second, Professor Chan has chosen to speak on a topic that is of particular interest to us here in Westmont, and that is faith. Christians tend to think faith is a good thing. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13, it is with hope and charity listed as one of the three theological virtues. And the Gospels describe it as a source of power. Uh, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. Um, but what is faith? Hebrews says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But then, Described in that way, uh, faith is not, in everybody's mind, a good thing. Sam Harris, in Letter to Christian Nation, famously says, faith is generally nothing more than the permission religious people give to one another to believe things strongly without evidence. Richard Dawkins says, faith is one of the world's great evils, comparable to the smallpox virus but harder to eradicate. <laughs> and Christopher Hitchens says, faith is the surrender of the mind. It's the surrender of reason. It's the surrender of the only thing that makes us different from other animals. Now understood like that, it's hard to see why it would be both commanded and regarded as a virtue. Professor Chan will be speaking for somewhere in the hour range, 45 minutes to an hour, uh, and there will be time for question and answer after that. Please join me in welcoming to Westmont, Professor Rebecca Chen. Hi, thanks for having me. All right, so as you can see from the title here, the talk's entitled, Is Faith Good for Me? Um, perhaps it would have been better titled, Is Faith Good for You? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I wanna begin with two stories, and I intentionally don't have pictures for this slide because I want you to envision the story being about you, all right? So our first story is about Blaze. So Blaze encounters a deity, an omnipotent, omnibenevolent deity, and the deity says to Blaze, hey listen, I can make you the happiest person ever. Um, in fact, I can make you unsurpassably happy. Like, it's not going to be possible for you to get any happier than you are when I get done with you. Uh, but here's the catch. You're going to be a little different once this happens. Uh, you're going to have really different preferences. Your life goals will definitely change. And the way you see the world will be radically altered. Right? Blaze mulls this over and is trying to decide whether or not he should accept the offer to become this unsurpassably happy person at the cost of radical change. All right, our second story is about Lucia. So Lucia is just like an ordinary person. She too encounters this deity. The deity has like a slightly different offer slash request of Lucia than the deity does for Blaze. Um, here's what the deity says to Lucia. 
Uh, Lucia, I would really like you to adopt my ways. Uh, so I'd like you, and like, look, they're not like evil ways or anything. They're actually pretty good. Uh, I'd like you to be a little kinder, more loving, more caring towards others, et cetera, et cetera. And I understand you might have done some of these things on your own, but I would like you to do them because this is like my way and I want you to adopt my way. Or you can carry on with things the way they're currently going for you. Um, and as with Blaze, uh, adopting my ways will come with pretty substantial changes. So for example, your preferences are going to be different. Whereas you might have just done stuff thinking about you or what you want to do for other people. Now you're going to also be thinking about how I would prefer that things go. Right? Your life goals will be different. The way you see the world will be different. Right? So Lucia Molson Silver, she's thinking, do I want to change in this way? OK. Now, notice that both of these stories are about people who are making choices about the way they want to live their lives. Um, they're making choices about two possible future outcomes. All right? um, so in order to think about whether it will be good for them or what they should do, we've got to think a little bit about decision making. So here's decision making 101. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll start out with like a pretty simple option. OK, so here's option one. Um, you're offered like a pot of gold, and you're like, oh, this is pretty sweet. Like, that's pretty valuable, right? Uh, here's option two. You can have like an entire layer of gold, mm. all right? Um, and so like you look at these two things, and you're like, which of these should I prefer, right? And like hopefully the answer seems sort of obvious. Like obviously you should want this one because there's more. And of course, like, don't think that this is just purely about money. Like, let the gold represent what matters most. So like, it could be like your happiness, like the value of your life, right? The idea basically just is like, look, there's more good stuff here than here. Like, obviously, you should prefer this. Um, and so this is basically what practical reason is about. Um, when we think about what we should do practically, what we're doing is we're thinking about what we ought to do, at least like from a very practical point of view, all right? And, like, Hopefully in this exam you can see like, yeah, like obviously you ought to like pick this outcome or you prefer it, right? Um, and like what we care a lot about is what it's rational for you to prefer, right? And so now I want to introduce you to um, sort of like the model that we'll be talking a lot about today. And this is what I'm going to call the Pascalian model, all right? Uh, and here's what it is. Um, this is basically a model in which self or rational preference is determined by self-interest, all right? Um, self-interested value. And we'll talk a little more about exactly what that is. But for now, I just want to get this on the table. Um, so here's like decision making 101. All right, notice that so far in these choices, we haven't introduced a complication, all right? Um, this complication is risk. So you know that layer of gold seems pretty sweet, uh, but it may turn out to be somewhat inaccessible if inhabited by, say, a dragon, <laughs> all right? Um, and so like, of course, when there's risk, we've got to factor this in, and so people, who are into this type of thing are really fond of making these decision matrices where you think about the two outcomes and then like how likely each outcome is, right? So like you're like, okay, look, if I go for Smog's Lair, like maybe I get a billion pieces of gold or value, but like there's only a 1% chance I actually come away with that. Now I've got to weigh that against the fiery death outcome, which is 99% likely, <laughs> or I can just settle for like the safe thing, that pot of gold, right? Um, so this is like a further complication is, ri is risk. Uh, you can actually set this aside for the talk. We're just going to pretend that um, there's no risk involved, all right? At this point, you might be thinking about another familiar um, decision matrix. So this is Pascal's wager. So like traditionally, the way the wager goes is like, hey, you can choose to believe in God. And good news, like if God exists, you're going to get infinite value, right? Um, if God doesn't exist, don't worry. I mean, it's not the greatest, but there's some finite value. And now look, if you don't believe, like there's also some finite values associated with that. Since you've got three finite values and then an infinite one, as long as like the chances that God exists are non-zero, like you can go for that. All right. So here again, this is like the dragon version. There's risk, but like here's the really great news. Like the people we're thinking about, they don't even have to worry about this. All right. So here's like Blaze's decision, and this is just to simplify. Like at the end, you can ask me, what do we do if there's risk? Um, 
Well, I'm going to say it's like already complicated without the risk or non-obvious, right? So look, um, here's Blaze's decision. It's basically like we can choose the life of faith and then there's going to be some like positive infinite value or unsurpassable happiness. Or here's like option number two, don't choose faith and then there's finite, some finite value, right? It could even be negative, but as long as it's less than positive infinite, that's all we need. Um, and notice here like there's no risk, so it's just like, if you were thinking only about the values, you might think it's really obvious what Blaze ought to choose. Like Blaze ought to choose the positive infinite value. Why wouldn't you choose that, right? Um, something similar is going on with Lucia, all right? So look, here's option one for Lucia. She can choose to follow, um, and then there will be this transformative change, and then lots of value. Or you can choose not to follow, and then here there's no transformation, keep going the way you are, and then there's like mediocre value, all right? Um, so we've gotten rid of the risk here. And again, like if you just think about this in that like simple Pascalian model framework, you're like, oh yeah, like look at the value. There's lots of value versus mediocre value. Obviously, I ought to prefer the changing one, right? Okay. So here's sort of an overview of the rest of the talk. This contains my thesis and also the plan for the talk. Um, so here's my thesis. It's like a little bit of a spoiler. So what I'm gonna say is that choosing a life of faith is probably not in your self-interest, all right? Um, to put it another way, if you care about self-interest and what the Pascalian model re um, recommends that you prefer, you should not prefer adopting a life of faith, all right? Um, and then here's sort of what we'll do. We'll talk a little bit about this thing that I call self-transformation. Then we'll talk about why this spells trouble for the Pascalian model of rational preference. Then we'll talk about how faith is transformative. And then we'll get to some final thoughts about this. All right. All right. Before we dive into that first bullet point, though, I want to just like give you a few preliminaries to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, the first is that there's actually a lot of different ways of understanding what faith is, all right? Um, and there are two like major ways people tend to break this up. The first is what people call propositional faith. So this is faith that, and then fill in the blank, all right? So for example, faith that God is good, faith that God exists, um, faith that your friend is telling the truth. And what this is about is like, it's an attitude that you have to something that like could be held as a belief, basically, like a claim, all right? There's also a type of faith um, that's non-propositional. So this is not about like a particular claim, all right? Uh, rather, it's cashed out in a slightly different way. So like one popular um, type of non-propositional faith is faith in. So this is something like the faith you would have in a friend or the faith you would have in God. So maybe like you trust your friend to have your best interests in mind, right? Um, you trust in God to like not lead you astray or have a plan for you, right? Um, another important type of non-propositional faith, and this is the type that we care about for this talk, um, I'm really interested in faith as expressed in action, all right? So here, you're expressing that you have faith by acting a certain way, all right? Um, we might call this just like acting faithfully, but you might think about like, you hear this rumor that your friend's like telling lies about you. And one thing you do is like confront your friend and demand to know if it's true, right? Um, or another thing you could do is just like trust that your friend hasn't been spreading like lies about you and just ignore them, right? So like there, there's an action involved, right? And so you can act more or less faithfully, right? Um, so yeah, we care about faith as expressed in an action. Okay, here's another preliminary. There are also different types of reasons for action. All right, um, so like practical reason covers like a huge umbrella of things because remember, this is about what you ought to do. So one key factor in what you ought to do is just like your self-interest, right? Um, but another key factor in what you ought to do is what people like to call moral reasons, right? So maybe like there's a moral reason for you to not lie. So even if it's like in your self-interest, at least for the time being, to tell a little white lie, you shouldn't do that morally speaking, right? Um, people also like to talk about all things considered reasons. So here it's like, take up all those small things, like what you morally should do, what it's in your self-interest to do, um, add them up and then you come up with like, in the grand scheme of things, here's what I should do. So we might call that an all things considered reason, right? 
Uh, and so here I just want to clarify that like when we talk about the Pascalian model, we're really only talking about rational preferences wholly determined by self-interest. Right? So we're not talking about moral reasons. We're not talking about what you should do, all things considered. We're just talking about self-interest. And there's a reason for this. So you might think like, oh, this is looking like pretty easy. Like maybe we should still have faith, just not for self-interested reasons. And that's totally, um, that might turn out to be right. But the reason that we should care about self-interest is because a lot of people have tried to justify the rationality of faith by appealing to self-interest. So like one way of interpreting Pascal is by saying like, look, when you decide whether or not you should have faith, what you should do is think about the values, right? So think about what Pascal is saying, like we've got infinite value on one hand and then like these measly finite values on the other hand. You should go for the infinite value. And that value that Pascal is talking about is like self-interested value. Um, there are more contemporary philosophers who have also talked about the connection between practical rationality and faith. And I think one very natural way to interpret them is um, to be saying that, look, it's in your self-interest to act in faith or to act faithfully. Right. Um, there's also like another reason. It's is sort of like more of a dialectical, like argumentative reason. But when all you're talking about is self-interest, this is like super low commitment. All right. So like imagine trying to convince someone to say like convert. All right. And you're like, hey, you should convert because this is like the right thing to do. Like God is good, and like that's why you should convert. Okay, this requires that person to take on like a whole bunch of like new beliefs and new commitments, right? They've gotta believe God exists. They've gotta believe God is good. They've gotta believe that like they should do that thing um, for those reasons. On the other hand, if you approach someone, you're like, hey, listen, um, this is gonna go really well for you. Like self-interest is a thing that everyone can get on board with, right? Um, so if you think about like what Pascal was doing like historically, Pascal was saying like, hey, I know that you guys might ha be having a hard time like convincing yourselves that like it's true that God exists um, and that you should believe for like purely evidential reasons. But here's like something that everyone can latch onto. It's like this self-interested value, right? Um, so there's also this sort of dialectical reason we're only going to talk about self-interest, right? Okay. There are only two more preliminaries, I promise. So like the first one is, I'm gonna talk a lot of, about preference, um, but also in this context, it's gonna be interchangeable with choice. Um, and the reason is this, like if you have a rational preference, then like assuming you can actually make the choice, like it's gonna also be rational to choose the thing that you prefer, all right? So just think about something as simple as like what you chose to eat for breakfast today, or maybe what you chose to drink. So maybe like some of your coffee people some of you are orange juice people. Um, and so like, you think to yourself, which do I prefer? Which has the most value for me? And you're like, if you're like me, you're like, coffee, definitely, mm -hmm. right? So it's like rational for me to choose to prefer coffee. It's also rational for me to choose coffee. Um, the reason I talk about preference a little more is that some of these cases are gonna involve like the past where you can't actually choose the thing anymore. So in some cases, like the choice might not be live, but we can still like reasonably talk about preferences. Like I can like think to myself, oh man, I didn't have enough coffee today. I prefer to have like had the right amount or Right now, I'm over-caffeinated. I prefer that I hadn't uh, <laughs> drank that extra coffee. Right? OK, and then the last thing is just, um, for the purposes of this talk, assume that everything is epistemically transparent. Uh, what this means is like, assume that everyone has like perfectly true beliefs. There's no like risk. There's no accidental um, misunderstandings. There's no mistake, all right? so. Basically, just assume that everything is like as it appears. So like from the perspective of Blaise and Lucia, like hearing this deal from the deity, they're not worried about like, oh, this might be a trick. Or, oh, this person might not be able to carry through. Just assume like it is what it seems. OK. So that's the end of these preliminaries. Now we can dive in. Um, here's the first thing we're going to talk about is self-transformation. Um, and so to sort of like warm you up to what's going on here, we'll start with um, thinking about what it is to have sort of a transformative experience, all right? Do any of you read Calvin and Hobbes? I don't know if this is like, there seems to be a very sharp demographic divide here. Okay, well, Calvin and Hobbes, in case you've never read it, is a fantastic comic strip. Okay, and so here, um, so Hobbes is the tiger. Calvin is like this little kid who's sort of obnoxious and self-centered. Anyway, so Calvin's decided he wants to turn into a tiger, so we've got Hobbes 
like looking at him in the transmogrification machine. He's like, so you're a tiger now? And Calvin's like, yep, let me out. And as you can see, Calvin turned into a little tiger. Uh, Hobbes says, words fail me. And Calvin says, I'm disappointed too, but keep in mind transmogrification is a new technology. <laughs> All right, so like the idea here is like, look, before Calvin turned into a tiger, Calvin couldn't know what it was like to be a tiger. All right, and that's what it is for an experience to be epistemically transformative. All right, so basically like the agent can't know what it's like until they've had the experience. Um, there are some foods that are sort of like this. So I don't know if any of you have ever had um, marmalite or Vegemite. It's like this weird, like, sort of, I don't even know how to describe it, but it's like this very weird thing that they do in like Britain and Australia. Okay, anyway, that's like a taste that many people say like they don't, they couldn't like imagine what it would be like until they had it. Um, let's see, durian is another case. I think it's revolting. Uh, some people like think it's really good. What, what was that? Durian. Durian. It's like a fruit from Asia <laughs> that you like peel off the oh, skin. So some people really love it. They have like durian smoothies, and I'm like, this is disgusting. Why would you do that? <laughs> um, but the thing is, it's like before you actually try durian, you can't really predict if you'll be like one of the I love it or I hate it people. It's also really hard to like explain what it tastes like. Um, okay. But there's another way an experience can be transformative, uh, and this goes beyond the like discovering what it's like. And this is captured again by good old Calvin. So Calvin walks in the house after transforming, and he's like, hi, Mom, will you make Hobbs and me a big tuna sandwich? His mom's like, I thought you hated tuna fish. He says, not anymore. I'm a tiger now. She's like, I thought Hobbs is your tiger. No, now I'm one too. I'm transmogrified. Oh, I see. He says, my, she's taking this well, but surely the strain will crack her soon. <laughs> okay, so what's going on here is like, Calvin used to hate tuna, but now he's a tiger and he has this new preference, all right? Um, and this is what it is to be personally transformed, all right? So some experiences will transform you in like a deeply personal way. And what this means is like, you are gonna have your core preferences, maybe your life goals, uh, maybe the way of seeing the world, it's going to change, right? Um, and when you put these two things together, the epistemic transformation and the personal transformation, um, you get what's called a transformative experience. And so this is an experience that's both epistemically and personally transformative. So you won't know what it's like before you have it, and also it's going to change you in really unpredictable ways, right? Um, the part that we're going to focus on is this personal transformation part, where your core preferences, life goals, and way of seeing the world radically changes. And I've got even more examples for you. Um, people report that becoming a parent for the first time, all right, this is transformative. Uh, gaining a new sense modality, so for example, if you're deaf and then you get a cochlear implant, or if you've seen the videos of people who like are colorblind and then they can see color for the first time, all right. Um, becoming a member of a new social group. And by this, I don't, I mean, maybe it could just be as simple as like, oh, I joined, wait, do you have like sororities here? <laughs> okay, no, that's excellent. Um, <laughs> that's probably really good for you. So like, it could be as simple as like, I joined like this new group with the popular cool kids and like now I see the world differently. But like, I think like also it could be something much deeper. Like, I probably don't understand what it's like to be a man at all. Or I don't understand what it's like to be in like a condition completely different like racial category, right? Um, it could be like that type of social group too, right? Um, and of course, like our favorite case, uh, religious conversion or apostasy, like this could also count as a very transformative experience. Um, maybe some of you have had this type of transformative experience, like either you converted and like now you see your life in a whole different way. Or maybe you used to be religious and now um, you're not so much into that. And like the way you see things has like definitely changed, right? Okay, so these are more examples of ways in which you can change in like this sort of deeper way, all right? Okay. There's another thing sort of connected to this that I wanna talk about now, and this is the idea of like first personal projection. All right, so I'll start with just like the difference between first person and second person. Um, this is like from a really old, it's like the best first, 
first and shooter game. This was like GoldenEye 007. You guys never played N64, did you? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, but like you can see, like I think these days it's like Halo or Counter Strike, right? Like when you play the game, it's like from the perspective of the person shoot. That's like first person shooter, right? Um, compare this to something like Fortnite, where actually it's like in third person, all right? So like you're not seeing like the screen from the perspective of the person doing stuff. It's like you're sort of behind the action. Um, okay, so this is like an analogy. This is not like, it doesn't map on exactly, but this is an analogy. So there's this thing called first personal projection. So here what you're doing is you're imagining yourself from the perspective of that future self having the experience. And this works really well when it's like you in a very similar like situation to what you've experienced before. You can just imagine like yourself experiencing it. Right, because you and that future self are very tightly connected. There haven't been any substantial changes. Um, just think about like what you had for breakfast today, and then like having that same thing tomorrow. Right. Um, there's also this way of imagining things called like third personal projection. Right. And so here too, you're imagining yourself as you currently are, having some experiences. But the problem is like having those experiences might occur from like a different perspective when you get to them. And this is like a bigger change. So maybe think about like what it'd be like for you to get, I don't know, your first job or like have your first kid. I don't know how far down the line you guys want to go. But at a certain point, like what you're doing is like when you imagine that, you're thinking about yourself like as you are now having that experience as opposed to like first personally getting what's going on when that experience occurs, right? Um, like the best you can do is like you can put yourself in someone else's shoes, but this isn't the same thing as like imagining what that future experience will be like from the perspective of the future person. Um, here's like one more example. Hopefully this helps also. Um, so this is like Napoleon at Austerlitz. And so there's this philosopher, David Velleman, and he asks us to imagine like what it would be like to be Napoleon looking over this scene. Now my guess is that you're doing one of two things. One thing you could be doing is like, you're just imagining looking over this scene, but it's you who's imagining that, right? Um, in order to like first personally imagine it from the perspective of Napoleon, it's not good enough to just like try to imagine would be like if you were in Napoleon's shoes. Like you have to imagine being Napoleon and seeing that. But this starts to look like it's impossible because like how could you get into like the headspace of Napoleon? Like you'd have to erase like all traces of you in order to properly do it. But at that point it's just like you're not imagining yourself being Napoleon looking, you're just like it's Napoleon looking, all right? Okay, well this is actually sort of important for decision making, okay? So like if you're thinking about decision making and self-interest, um, you're thinking about what it's like for you to have those experiences and like for you to experience that value gained from the experience, right? Um, and it's really easy to do this in the first personal case where it's like you imagine what it'll be like to have breakfast tomorrow. Like you had breakfast this morning, you've had breakfast a lot, like you can tr probably figure out like what the experience will be like, what the value associated with it will be, and how you'll like enjoy that value. Um, but it's not so easy in the third person case. Uh, in fact, it's maybe like conceptually impossible. So like maybe I'm sitting here trying to imagine what it'll be like for you to have breakfast tomorrow, but actually I can't really do this. Like I can imagine what it'll be like for me to have breakfast or I could like become you and imagine having breakfast, but I can't like be me imagining to be you experiencing breakfast, all right? Um, so look. What it turns into is just like you figuring out what's in someone else's self-interest, but then we're no longer really talking about self-interest. We're talking about what's good for other people, not what's good for you, all right? Um, so like I could definitely pick out something um, for breakfast for like a close friend. Like I just be like, oh yeah, I know my friend loves chai tea, so I'll just order him some chai tea, right? But like that's not a self-interest thing, right? We're gonna talk about the difference between practical and metaphysical identity. Right. And so what I want to try to convince you of is that there are two ways of conceiving of ourselves. All right. The first way is metaphysically, and the second way is practically. Um, how many of you are philosophy majors or have taken like an intro philosophy class? Just out of curiosity. A few of you? Some of Currently you? Currently taken. Okay, that's cool. Um, I mean, 
Did you guys, did any of you guys talk about personal identity? No? Okay. Not yet. Well, here's your crash course in personal identity. Um, basically, you might think to yourself, like, here's one way you can put it. Uh, what are the conditions that are necessary and sufficient for me to survive, all right? Um, or to put it a different way, what is it that makes a person at T1, so like some earlier time, and a person at T2, some later time, the same person, all right? So think of yourself like now, and maybe think of yourself like five years ago, or when you were in high school, and look, um, what is it that makes you like the same person? What is it that you couldn't change about you in order to survive, all right? And so typically when we answer this question in like the metaphysics class, we care about this thing called personal identity. And here are some of the answers that people have like classically given. So some people might say like, look, we all have souls. So what it is to survive in like a later time is for you to still have like the same soul and for that soul to survive, right? And actually there's like a really cool implication of this view, it's like, this means that for you to survive like your bodily death, that's totally possible because like as long as your soul survives, you're good, right? Um, there are different views relating to like your body being the crucial part. So some people will give an answer like as long as you have the same body or as long as like your body has been changing continuously, right? So like all of us, like our cells recycle we literally have like completely different cells than we did seven years ago, but that's okay as long as it goes like gradually in like this organic process, all right? So as long as that hasn't been interrupted, you're gonna count as the same person. You'll have survived from like seven years ago, okay? Um, another answer people have given is like, oh, what matters is like your psychology, um, that you have like this continual like psychology, like you're adding memories, maybe you forget stuff, but that's okay as long as you don't forget like everything, right? Um, okay, so these are some of the answers people have given in the past for this metaphysical question, right? Um, question of personal identity. And from this, um, we can think, if you want to get like really nerdy, mm -hmm. uh, we can call these types of things like essential features, all right? Um, so basically think about yourself and think about whatever theory you prefer. So this is gonna be um, what's essential for your survival. So a person P has a feature F essentially in this like metaphysical sense, if and only if P has F if P exists. All right, so like you've got your soul if you exist. If you're, something happens to your soul, like that's it. You don't exist anymore, all right? Um, all right, we'll skip this next part. There's different ways of cashing this out, but that's the rough idea. Here are some examples. Um, Here's an essential property like maybe having a soul, maybe being a thinking animal. These are things that are like crucial to your survival, all right? Here's some things that are non-essential, um, maybe like being 5'2", uh, having the best cat. I always try to sneak my cat on this side. Here's my chance, all right? That's the best cat. And I didn't always have her. She's only like 10, so obviously I'm older than her. And look, like this, isn't, this clearly isn't essential for me surviving, right? Um, but you can contrast this with this other sort of notion of like who you are. Um, and actually this is literally what it sounds like. So like your practical identity is like who you are, right? Here's like another way to put it. Um, which characteristics or features are truly those of the person or best express who that person is, right? Um, and here like the examples we get are gonna be a little different. So just like think about yourself. Um, for me, one of them is probably like being a philosopher. If I wasn't a philosopher, I'd be like lost. Like, what's going on here? Um, for a lot of people, identifying with a particular religious tradition is also a very crucial part of who they are, practically speaking. Like, it informs their daily lives and the decisions they make and like the things they try to pursue, right? Um, and really just think about it for your own case. And like, the answers can vary here. Um, the really cool thing to notice is that, look, none of these fall under the things that we just talked about for personal identity, right? Like none of these have anything to do with like having a soul or like having bodily integrity or having like psychological continuity, right? These are all things that like you typically don't think of when you just ask the question like, what does it take for you to survive? Um, but these are like the things that are deeply important in making up like who you are as a person, right? And so this is um, what I call practical identity. I'll give you like one more story about how important practical identity could be. So there was this um, philosopher, he recently passed away, 
um, Derek Farfait, he tells this story about this young Russian. So this is like back in the time of like the revolution or something, all right? And so um, there's this young Russian and actually he's like a socialist. He has these very like lofty socialist ideals. He's like joined the cause. Um, but it turns out that he's actually like the nephew of like a really rich aristocrat who doesn't have any children. And like when that rich aristocrat dies, he's gonna inherit all that money. And he knows that like inheriting that money is gonna be a transformative experience. Like maybe it'd be like you winning the lottery basically, all right? And like once, he, he knows that once he has that money, like his lofty socialist ideals are gonna disappear and he's gonna become like an aristocrat just like the rest of his family. Okay, and um, he goes so far as to tell his wife, hey listen, um, when this happens, I want you to treat me as if I'm dead. And actually I'm gonna like sign the money away to you like beforehand and I want you to take it and not give it back to me because I don't want to lose my socialist ideals. They're like basically who I am and if I lose them, they'll be the same as me not existing, all right? And you can see how this starts to make a big difference in the way we think about decisions. Um, we'll get to this more a little later, but look, um, when you might think like, look, if you abandon your ideals, like when you're super rich, it's actually gonna go well for you. Like you're gonna have like this really pleasurable life, maybe even objectively speaking, it's not that bad to have a lot of money, all right? Um, so like you might imagine that's like better than him keeping his ideals. But look, um, to the young Russian, like abandoning his ideals, that's like the same as not existing at all. And so it's like, oh, well I know there's like a lot of value associated with whoever it is that turns out there and like has that money, but like I just don't identify with that person because they're so different from who I am, right? Okay, so just as we talked about those um, metaphysically essential features, we can also talk about what it is to have a feature essentially, practically speaking. And this is gonna be about you regarding a particular feature as being essential to who you are, all right? So here are some examples um, that young Russian uh, really thinks his socialist ideals are part of his practical essence, right? Um, think about yourself, like which features do you find are practically essential to you, right? Okay, we can now arrive sort of like at this def definition. This is what we've been driving for in this section. We wanna understand what it is to undergo self-transformation, all right? And so this is gonna be a change undergone by an agent S between two times, T and T prime. You can imagine that T prime is the later one. Uh, when and only when S at T prime lacks some feature that S at T regards as essential, all right? And I wanna draw your attention to um, one important part of this, and that's the what S regards as essential part. Um, because I think it's really important to highlight that that essential feature can vary from person to person, right? Um, so for example, like that young Russian socialist like really um, values like, or really regards um, his socialist ideals as essentially who he is. Maybe you can contrast this with like some of the Bernie bros who like were really into it, but like they weren't so into it that they were like really disturbed and then like still showed up to vote, right? That's not the same thing. So this can like vary from person to person, right? Um, here's another feature. You might think, wait, couldn't the person be mistaken about what's practically essential to them? Like maybe this like Russian kid is just really delusional about how important it is to stay, have like socialist ideals. Maybe he'll find that once he inherits the money and loses those ideals, he's not really that different. Um, okay. So here's like a few things to say about this. I'm not gonna say that mistake is impossible, but when you think about what it is to make a rational decision, um, what's really important is like your frame of mind and like the information that you take to be true, all right? So um, what it is to count as rational is to do things that are rational combined with like the beliefs you currently have. So for example, right? Um, suppose you really wanna talk to your friend all right, and you believe that your friend is like hanging out in the library, all right? Well, what it's like rational for you to do is to go to the library, all right? Now, maybe it turns out that your friend isn't there. Your friend's actually like at the gym, all right? Well, given like what you believe to be true and that you wanted to go talk to your friend, right? It would have been really irrational to go like the gym where you didn't believe your friend was as opposed to the library, right? So even though you turned out to be wrong, to have made a mistake, it was still rational to go to the library, right? Similarly here, like maybe you're wrong about which 
features are actually essential to who you are as like a person. Um, but that's okay, as long as like you operate given the belief that you have about what you regard as being essential, you're okay in terms of rationality. Also, and this is like the cheating way, this is like a lesson for you to take away. Um, remember at the beginning we just said all the agents are like good, they're not making mistakes. So again, here, just pretend they're not. It's a complication, um, but we're good for now. Okay, so back to our overview, we've just covered what self-transformation is. Now we're gonna talk about how this spells trouble for the Pascalian model. Um, in order to get there, we're gonna have to go through a few steps. So first I'm gonna tell you about two past cases, um, then we're gonna diagnose these cases, and then we're gonna talk about the future, all right? The diagnosing part is where the self-transformation is gonna come back in. Okay, here's the first story. Um, this is called non-identity. So imagine this person, Wilma, and she really wants to have a child. All right, so she goes to the doctor, she's like, hey, I'm thinking about having a child. And the doctor says, well, you can conceive now and you will have like just a totally normal baby. Or you can take this drug and wait a month to conceive and your baby will have like Derek Parfit's philosophical brilliance. <laughs> your baby will have like LeBron James's athletic gifts and also like don't let the moral features go. Your baby will have like Mother Teresa's kindness or something, pick your favorite figure, right? Okay, so you can have like normal baby or super baby, right? So like Wilma, oh, okay. um, she decides to just like conceive right away and she has pebbles, all right? But we could have imagined like super pebbles or pebbles plus who was like this Derek Parfit, LeBron James, Mother Teresa combo, all right? And so now we ask the child, we say, hey, um, from the standpoint of self-interest, should Pebbles prefer that Wilma had waited to conceive? All right, so should that person prefer that her mom had waited to have that person? Right. Let's take a quick poll, actually. Um, what do you guys think? Who thinks that, yes, she should wish that her mom had waited? From the stand, right? Who thinks, like, no, this is crazy. Like, she should not wish that her mom had waited. Okay, good. Like. Here's the thing, right? Here, so here's well, um, Pebbles thinking about it. Like, if her mom had waited, right, she wouldn't exist. There would be like some super Pebbles that exist, but that wouldn't be her. Like, she would just like have never been brought into existence, right? Um, so like, what's going on here is like when you think about value, there's like two different ways of thinking about it. So like, yeah, from like a really impersonal point of view, I guess it'd be better for the world if like super Pebbles existed, right? But from Pebble's point of view, just from like pure self-interest, it's obviously better for her to like be happy that her mom like conceived, right? Um, so this gives us like our first lesson here. When we think about different outcomes, we need to consider two things, all right? We need to consider value, but we also need to consider like that special type of value, self-interested value, um, because that's also connected to whether we exist. So like when you're evaluating like two outcomes, yeah, it's great to look at value. Here's another thing you should check for. You should check for whether you exist in both of those outcomes, <laughs> all right? Um, okay, so that's our first um, past case. Here's our second past case. Okay, so imagine this person, John, all right? There's John. Um, John suffered some childhood trauma, all right? Um, but John overcame this trauma and grew up and now actually he's living like a pretty decent life. Uh, and like this trauma has sort of shaped the person that he's become, right? Uh, now John considers, would I have preferred to live in this world where that trauma did not occur? Um, because you know, like if that trauma hadn't occurred, like my childhood would have been better. Also like it wouldn't have made me worse off as a grown up, right? I would just be like different, but I would have still experienced like the same amount of value as an adult, let's say. So like overall, uh, my life, that life of that person without the trauma would be better than my life, right? So we ask, like, from the standpoint of self-interest, should John prefer the alternative past in which he does not experience the trauma to, like, his current or his actual past where he did, all right? Here's something that's different between this case and the Wilma case with Pebbles. When Pebbles thinks about those two outcomes and she checks for like existence, it's like in one scenario she exists and the other one she doesn't. But here for John, the say, there's something slightly different going on, right? Because in both cases, like it would have been John in like this metaphysical sense. It'd just be him minus trauma and like sort of different. 
So we can imagine John thinking this way, all right? And so this is John acknowledging that like, so it is true that had my early life gone better, the resulting life would be better overall than my own. However, that life would be radically different from mine, sorry, typo, and I don't want a life so alien from my own. And so here are the things to like notice about this, all right? Again, the difference between there being like metaphysical identity in this case, but not in the earlier case. But here's like the other crucial thing. Um, if you're persuaded by this type of reasoning, which I think is actually like sort of reasonable, all right? And if you think that John is rational, then we've got a problem, all right? Because if John is rational here in thinking this way, this means that self-interest isn't going to determine rational preference. Because when you think about the fact that like it's John and then just like non-traumatized John, but it's not like the Pebbles case, non-traumatized John, like that value is like value that non-traumatized John experiences. And he's like the same person, just like in a different outcome, right? And then John obviously experiences like the self-interested value in his actual life, right? Okay, so what I wanna say is this case spells trouble and we've gotta like look a little closer at it, all right? Okay, so here we're in the diagnosis stage. Okay, when we want to diagnose the past case, here are like the competing diagnoses. One, you could say John is irrational. Two, you could say, actually surprise, John is not identical to non-traumatized John. Or you could say, there's this third thing going on. All right, and spoiler, we'll go for the third thing, <laughs> but let's get there first. So first you could say like, maybe um, John is irrational, all right? Um, but here's the problem. It actually seems like this is a totally reasonable thing for a person to say. It's like, I'm actually okay with this past thing that happened that wasn't so good because it shaped who I am and I like who I am. All right, so here, like, there are lots of cases in the philosophical literature. That's Helen Keller. Um, she lost, like, her sight and her hearing, but then, like, went on to do incredible things. And so here Robert Adams, like, asks us to do the following. Let us suppose that she would have had an even better and happier life if her sight and hearing had been spared, though that is not obviously true. Um, her actual life and its emotional as well as its sensory qualities and its skills and projects and doubtless in much of her personality and character was built around the fact of her blindness and deafness. That other happier life would have contained few of the particular joys and sorrows, in short, very little of the concrete content that she cared about in her actual life. Her never having been blind or deaf would have been very like her never, never having existed. Why should she wish for that given that she had existed? Um, and this is not like the only case we might think of. Um, so this other philosopher, Liz Harmon, has written about what it's like to be a young mother. Um, so you can imagine someone who had a kid like when they were really young and they're like, yeah, it would have definitely been easier if I had a kid like later in life when like I was more financially stable or whatever. And there have definitely been challenges I've had to overcome. But you can also think of it being totally reasonable for that person to be like, no, I'm actually like glad things turned out the way they are because I really love my kid. I wouldn't want to have waited and had a different kid, right? Okay, so it looks like this diagnosis isn't the best. Um, so now let's look at the metaphysical non-identity one. Okay, so here's like non-traumatized John, here's like traumatized John. He's like, okay, this person's super happy. <laughs> so you might think, okay, maybe they're not actually the same person, right? But actually like, I think you should say they are, and here's like a few reasons why, all right? So problem one is that this implies that like there's literally no other way your life could have gone. But this is just like false, it seems. Like surely your life could have gone a little better, it could have gone a little worse, like you could have had like orange juice instead of coffee this morning, all right? Here's problem two, um, we can in fact wish that our lives had gone differently, like rationally wish they'd gone differently. Like you can wish that you had one less cup of coffee this morning mm -hmm. or that you'd had one more, all right? Um, here's like the bigger problem though, like if you do decide to go this route, then you've got a major problem for any type of decision making because then it starts to look like whatever choice you made, that was the optimal choice because that's the only way you would have survived. Like you wouldn't exist in the alternative scenarios, right? Okay, so back to our three competing diagnoses. Here's the last one, practical non-identity. This is the one I wanna say is correct, all right? Um, so look, what this sh should show us is that value plus like the metaphysical identity is necessary, 
but it's not sufficient. So it's not enough. We need a little more. What we also need is practical identity. So here, think back about that first section where we talked a lot about self-transformation. Um, what we want is like to make sure that we survive into the future or that we are like connected in the appropriate way. That like the person who we get is like the person who connects with who we are, practically speaking. So here are some options. These are like the lessons we can draw from the past. All right. Here's option one. Keep the Pascalian model exactly as it's typically interpreted and insist that only value and metaphysical identity matter. If you do this, then we can just like end the talk right now. It doesn't work, all right? Um, here's like option two. We can revise the Pascalian model and say that um, value and metaphysical identity are necessary but not sufficient. We just need to add in practical identity, all right? Um, if you do this, turns out it also won't work, but in a diff for a different reason why. But here's like the big insight to take away. Like a lot of times we just think that like all that matters is value and metaphysical identity because most of our decisions are pretty mundane. They're like, what do I want to drink for breakfast? Or would I rather have a thousand dollars or a million dollars? Like here, there's never any question of your practical identity being lost, right? But when you're like encountering something that does involve that potential, this problem arises. Like whenever you are facing a decision involving self-transformation, like maybe having a child or maybe like religiously converting, right? You're gonna have to worry about this. So what we've done so far is we've argued for this first premise, all right? That what we need when we think about what agents should rationally prefer is we need value, we need the metaphysical <coughs> identity, and we also need to make sure there's practical identity, all right? The second premise of this argument just says like, look, whatever you needed for those past cases, that's what also what you need for the future cases, all right? And if that's right, then that means that when we think about future preferences and whether they're rational, we need the same three things. We need value, metaphysical identity, and practical identity. Here's a question we have to ask. Is adopting the life of faith, does this involve self-transformation? I'm gonna say yes, and I'm gonna give you um, different examples in a moment, right? So first, uh, think about the story of Saul on the road to Damascus, like being blinded by the light and like falling off his horse and then converting, right? Um, old Saul would have definitely like hunted down the resulting Paul who's now like a faithful follower of Jesus, right? Um, and look, like they're totally different. Like Paul says, it's as if the scales fell off my eyes, right? The way that he sees the world is different. He's acting in like a totally different way. He's different preferences and life goals, right? Um, if you think about like what's required to live the life of faith, so like think about Jesus saying like, let the dead bury the dead, right? What he's saying there is like, look, just like leave your old life behind. You've just got to like commit, right? Um, think about like baptism and like this idea of rebirth, right, and being reborn. Uh, do you guys watch Game of Thrones? <laughs> <laughs> right, so like, I was dead, I never died. All right, so anyway, like the idea is like you're reborn into a new person, right? You're transformed. Um, here's like another thing um, going on into the afterlife, right? So like. I've learned recently that my students don't really like Harry Potter that much, so sorry, I'm subjecting you to Harry Potter. I'm hoping you're cooler than my students and that you love Harry Potter. But like in the fifth Harry Potter, right, um, he like run, Harry runs to Nearly Headless Nick and asks him if like his godfather would have become a ghost. And Nearly Headless Nick says like, no, I don't think he would have. He's like, I became a ghost because I was afraid of like going on. And like he was afraid of like the unknown and like how he would change, right? So he opted to say the same. And like, look, actually, like according to self-interest, like this was not like the worst idea because he doesn't know how he would change. And when you think about how like heaven's described and what the beatific vision is, I think like all of us should be like, wait a second, like this sounds cool in a way, but in what sense will that person in heaven like be connected to me? Right? Okay. So look. Um, We've got faith is transformative. Here's another thing. Faith involves action. It's something you do. It's also a lifelong commitment. All right, so like you're opting to change pretty permanently. Um, you might think of this as like similar to marriage vows. I don't know if there are like other like big things that you would commit to. Probably like having children, like that's presumably for life also, right? And so when we <laughs> return to the Pascalian model, right, here was our conclusion about um, future preferences. Um, here's what we've got to ask ourselves. Look, 
Faith is transformative, so this means that outcomes involving faith are ones where the resulting agent is not necessarily practically identical to the one who made that decision. Mm. And so that means that on the basis of self-interest, you're not rationally required to prefer adopting the life of faith. Right? Again, like it's not, it might not be you that ends up living the faithful life. Um, and so here are the implications of this. The most obvious one is Pascal's wager. So here's like that familiar decision chart, all right? Um, so Pascal's wager isn't going to work because like it's great that we've got infinite value, but that's not the thing that should be like the deciding factor because you should look at this and be like, yeah, it's great that that future person will experience infinite value, but that person might not be me in the relevant sense. Um, there's this thing called Anselm's wager, which is really similar. This is basically Blaze's situation, where it's like, for sure, you're going to get that infinite value. For sure, God exists. But still, even in that situation, it might not be in your self-interest to go for it. Right? Um, I promised you some contemporary accounts. So um, there's this one philosopher up at Berkeley, Laura Buchak. Um, this is her account. Let me emphasize that it's an act of faith, all right? And notice that in here, she's talking about like risks and really what this account amounts to. You can ask me more about it. It's sort of cool. It's about how it'd be better for you to like act faithfully in some cases, even though initially it might have seemed like what you should do is like hold off for more evidence, all right? But again, the key here is like it being better for you, it being in your self-interest to act faithfully. I want to close up real quick with some final thoughts. There's this very traditional objection called the wrong reasons objection to this type of reasoning. So like we've talked a lot about thinking about self-interest as a reason to adopt a life of faith. And so people have often said like, doesn't this seem weird to you? Um, it might be the wrong type of reason. So like here's the first reason like you might think is like God's not going to really appreciate this. Like think of this as like someone like wanting to date you for like your money or like for the good stuff you can provide for them, right? This doesn't seem like a very endearing thing. Um, secondly, like this is like sort of disingenuous. You're not really interested in the person, right? You're just interested in what you can get out of it. But I hope what we've talked about today shows a way in which this is also a wrong reason and that's that self-interest doesn't even recommend that you ought to adopt a life of faith because it's like not in your self-interest, right? Um, returning to Lucia, this is adapted from like Anselm's Fall of the Devil. So like the way Anselm envisioned Satan falling was not like some super evil guy who was like, I hate you, God. It was more like there were two options, like follow the path of righteousness or follow the path of happiness. And it wasn't even like they completely diverged. It was just like, which of these two things does like the devil want to choose, right? Um, but here's the thing, again, like we shouldn't think of this as having been like grossly irrational, at least not from the point of self-interest, right? Um, and I actually think that this is really important because one of the things um, that goes on when you think about people who do things wrong, we want to think of them if, as having done something freely, all right? But also we want to think of them as having done something like in a reasoned way and not being like sort of dumb or irrational and making a mistake, all right? So when you like envision like the fall of the devil, like, and you think of it, oh no, like he was just like confused or he like acted irrationally, like that's gonna be really weird if you also wanna think that that person's responsible because what's going on then is like, this person is just like really irrational. What we want is for there to be like a robust sense of freedom that's like more than the ability to do what's rational, right? Or irrational. So you want it to be that like there was room to work that would like a reasonable person could have worked within, like there's this space of options and like one's not obviously like dumber than the other ones. And then like it seems like there's more responsibility on that picture. Finally, there's this thing called fideism. Here's like the typical version. Basically, it's like you have faith when the belief isn't required. This is like a very common thing you'll hear people say. So like the Sam Harris, like Dawkins people, they all say this. So um, they might think like, they usually take the extreme route. So like, look, the belief is irrational. And what it is to hold that belief is to like have faith. There's a more moderate version where it's like, you can have that belief, but it's not required. Well, what I've given you is like sort of a practical version for like your actions, right? So preferring or choosing something is not required. And that's what makes it an act of faith, right? And again, you've got the moderate and extreme versions. If you guys haven't read The Wager, like Pascal's wager, you should. Actually, you should read Pascal because he's really depressing. 
like in a really interesting way that's different from a lot of writers. Um, but if you read the wager, you'll get to the end. All right, so like Pascal's given the wager and told like the person he's speaking with all this stuff, and then the locator expresses some fear. All right, and then Pascal's like, what? Why? What do you have to lose? And so he goes on about a lot of things. Like for example, he talks about how you'll be a better human being. All right. Um, but he goes on to like talk about how you'll profit like in this life and the next. So again, that appeal to value. Like if you don't care about being moral, here's why you should still care. It's going to be better for you in this life. It's going to be better for you in the next life. And at the end, like he depicts the person he's talking with as being like really assuaged by these considerations. Like, oh yeah, I guess you're right. It will be better for me. It's in my self-interest, right? Um, but I want to say it's not so easy. It really isn't in your self-interest and you should think about it a little more. Thank you. Because I'll be changed, mm -hmm. myself will be different, mm -hmm. it's not clear that it will be in my self-interest. Mm -hmm. Because future Mark is going to be different from mm -hmm. present day Mark. Mm -hmm. Practically different. Practically different. Mm -hmm. uh, now, you went on and said, nevertheless, you might have other kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm for a life of faith, or for choosing faith. Um, moral reasons. Would it be consistent, for example, with your view that we have a, uh, I'm not saying this is your view, but is it consistent? You might say, um, people, we owe God our belief and commitment. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not in our best interest, yeah. or our self interest. <laughs> Yeah, if what that's... You, what is morally what we ought to do, even if it is not prudentially what we ought mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, that's okay. consistent with my view. So if it turns out the case that you're morally obligated to have faith in God, then it may be that when you take in, like, the all things considered, so, like, when you take in, like, the moral factors, the self-interest factors, etc., it may turn out that um, that's the case. I mean, like, you can just think of, like, an even more ordinary case. So, uh... Suppose like you've got some really good friends, maybe there's like five of them, and they're about to get like hit by a bus. You're like really strong, you can push all of them out of the way, but then you'll get hit by the bus. Like maybe morally speaking, you ought to do that. I think that's clearly not in your self-interest. Uh, so yeah, they can come apart. Sometimes you can be required to do what is not in your self-interest, or like that might be what you ought to do. Um, but I will say something in favor of self-interest. It is usually like a pretty big consideration. So even if it does get outweighed by moral reasons, uh, you should like think a lot about your self-interest. And this is like a big factor in what it's practically reasonable for you to do. Is it right to say that, that you think that it's not maybe clearly in our self-interest to choose something that will result in self-transformation? Mm -hmm. Because we can't know what our future self will prefer, what we can't know mm -hmm. what our our transformed self will prefer is that what's an issue? Our inability to know who that person will be, mm -hmm. or, or if they will share our the preferences we have now, mm -hmm. is that part of it? Is it my ignorance about my future self's preferences yeah. that mm -hmm. makes it not in my interest to mm -hmm. do something that will result in that transformation? Yeah, I think that this is part of what the problem is. Um, so part of what the problem is is that since it's really unpredictable how you'll change, you can't be sure of what your future self's preferences will be, and therefore it's really hard to predict like whether that'll be like whatever change occurs will be good for your future self. So that's one problem. Um, but I think that the problem actually goes a little deeper than that. And the deeper problem is that in addition to not knowing how your future self's preferences will change, I actually think this is like a pretty ordinary thing. Um, like I used to think that like I would never be able to go like more than a few days without playing basketball. Uh, and like I held this belief very strongly for like probably 25 years. And recently I've discovered this was like not true. Like, and I think definitely my earlier self would not have predicted this. But I think that you can change in a deeper way that's more than just like mere preference change. Uh, and so, like maybe a good example of this is the Saul to Paul conversion. So it's not merely that like Saul can't predict like that Paul's gonna have different preferences from him. It's that they may as well be like two completely separate people. Mm -hmm. And there's like really no practical connection between the two of them. Like the only connection is that like they share the same like metaphysical mm -hmm. self. 
Um, and I think that there are probably changes like this that occur to people. Like some of them are like a little on the sadder side. So like people who like go to war and come back, I think that they're often changed in like really deep ways that are more than just um, like changes in preferences. Maybe on the happier side is like people like find the person they're supposed to be with and then they end up like changing in like a really different unpredictable way, but like it's a good thing. Is the upshot of your view that it's irrational to desire self-transformation? I don't know if Samir remembers this. This was like a previous paper I wrote. So, oh, the Reds paper? Mm -hmm. I asked that because students are constantly writing, and mm -hmm. we're trying to peddle our education as a transformative one. Mm -hmm. and students say, I want that. And it seems like you, an, an implication here might be, careful what you wish for. It is, because like you might think, I should like go to college and like do this stuff and like what you're thinking is like it'll be like really valuable for me like I'll get value like it's in my self-interest um, but I think people don't really think about the ways that it changes them um, here's like one example uh, so like you know we go to grad so most of you have not gone to grad school here's like a little spoiler alert for you so you think to yourself um, you know Grad school is pretty cool because it's like fun. I'll get to do this thing I really like. Also, they're gonna like pay me to do it. So actually, it's not like that big of a financial cost. Like it's true, I won't have a job that I make more money at, but I'm not gonna go into debt, and I'll get to do something fun, and like they're gonna give me like some money. And so you think like, okay, so I just like will go to grad school, and I'll be fine. Um, but what people often don't realize is that like in going to grad school and like going through it, you often then become the person who like can't imagine not doing that thing. So whereas before you're like, if it doesn't work out, I'll just do this other thing and it's fine because like it's not like anything bad will happen. Once you go through grad school, you're like, oh no, like I can't imagine not doing philosophy anymore. I can't imagine not doing theology or whatever your field is, right? And then it becomes like really bad for you if you don't get to go on and like continue doing that. Whereas before, like you were like, whatever, I'll just do something else. Um, so yeah, I think that it's not always, so if what you care about is your self-interest, that's a really bad reason to want to transform. There might be other reasons to transform. Um, my own view is that you should transform if like, that's the type of person you want to be or like you choose it in the right way a way like not related to self-interest i think that morally speaking um you could do this also or there's also something similar so like one way you can think of lucia thinking about whether she wants to like decide to follow like god's ways is like actually in choosing that rather than like staying as she is what she's doing is like demonstrating that she's the type of person who like really cares about like morals and like is really committed to living life the right way or whatever and like that reveals something and like she's transformed in that um but in a way that's like not completely jarring and also in a way that's not about self-interest it's about these other considerations what would the process look like of getting to so having a moment where you, you want your self-interest you want to get to a point you get to that point and then you realize this is not what i want can you move backward can you go backward or can and would it be having to forget everything that you've learned and transforming your, your ideal self and going a completely different path? And at what point do we get stuck there? Do we get stuck there? And what does that kind of look like? I'm just curious for your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I think that you can get stuck there. And this is part of why it's really risky. Um, so like you can think about like solve, like that one wasn't by choice, but you could imagine like if it was and then like Paul like hanging out in jail and being like, actually, this sort of sucks. I'm not that into this, right? And it's like too late to go back because you can't like unconvert, like you've already seen the light. Um, another example, and this is like maybe a more everyday one, is like people who become parents, I think often like can't predict how much they'll actually like it. And so like the thing is you don't often hear about the people who are like actually being a parent really sucks. Um, but if you look hard enough or like you find honest enough people, there are people who say this and they're like, I really actually, like I like my kid and stuff, but I don't like being a parent. Uh, if I could go back, I'd probably like not want to do this. But you know, at that point, it's too late. You've got a kid, and you've got to like be a parent. Um, yeah, similar to like the grad school example. Like once you get through, it's like too late. You've got this preference now, and you wish you could get rid of it, but you have it. Do you know what that looked like in kind of like the terms of like faith, where 
you decide to believe something three years later, you're not sure if you want to believe it anymore. And since there is kind of a free choice, free will, you can almost not believe it anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if that's even a question, but what about situations that are less like parenting um, and more uh, floaty is the wrong term to use, but not as physical as that, like more about beliefs, I guess. Uh, one of the crucial claims I made was that faith is transformative, and I gave you all those examples. Um, some people have pointed out that actually not every single instance of choosing the life of faith is transformative in the same way. So here's one case. Um, suppose you are already living the life of faith, all right? And what you're choosing is whether to continue doing that as opposed to like adopting it for the first time. Um, in that case, what would actually be transformative is to like abandon your faith and go in the other direction, right? Um, so that would be a case where like this turns out a little differently, right? Um, I think there's, oh yeah, so another one, I think like what you're like thing about the beliefs that could go either way, maybe what you're getting at is um, there are some people who are really laid back and easygoing. Mm -hmm. And remember that like um, self-transformation is about you losing a feature that you regard as essential. Well, if you're just this easygoing person, he's like, no, I don't really like hold anything super like close to my heart. So I don't think I have any practically essential features. Then you're also not gonna fall into this camp. Right, because like you're just like I'm cool with whatever. Like we'll just see what happens. Um, I think I'll leave it to you to decide whether like there are cases like that or not. I I'm inclined to think that at least in like the case where you're gonna like die and then like go on, that's gonna be pretty transformative for everyone. But I don't know. Um, it really does depend a little bit on what your situation is, um, and I think that's just something that like people have to introspect and figure out for themselves. Just following up on that question, which I thought was uh, very interesting. Um, do, tell me your name, the woman who asked that question. Uh, Isabel. Isabel. Okay, so this is further to Isabel's question. I mean, part of what struck me about it is um, that it makes a difference how long or uh, versus how instantaneous the transformation is. Mm -hmm. If it's an instantaneous transformation, you know, like it's being, you're struck by lightning, you know, and mm -hmm. before and after. Um, there's not much that you're living through there. Mm -hmm. But is it, uh, 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 on the other hand, if we can imagine a transformative experience that takes a while. So before you're already at the other end, you can kind of see how this is going and you're already aware of some of what's, some of the changes. Um, but it's not like being struck by life. It's not instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So, and there might and I don't know if this is what you have in mind, but you might think, well, I'm kind of in the middle of this, and now I could go forward or I could go backward. Mm -hmm. um, and there, you know, again, which is different from being a parent or Saul's Damascus Road mm -hmm. uh, conversion. Um, but, uh, so I guess my question is, what's your sense for, <clears throat> of, the general pattern of faith transformations, are they instantaneous, like lightning, mm -hmm. or are they more like gestation or something? Oh, that's cool. I mean, I would think it depends a lot on the individual. So I can think of, I mean, like, there's the Paul case, but I can think of individuals I know who claim that it's like the instantaneous thing, or like one day they just had like this revelation. Um, I also know other people who say that it's just like been this slowly building thing and then like they just eventually realize like yeah this is what I believe and like this is the life that I'm committed to. Um, some of the examples that Lori Paul gives for transformative experiences are like this gradual thing so I think she thinks that marriage is sort of like this or being in a relationship with another person um, and like it just starts out like you know you go on a first date that clearly isn't going to like change who you are and like it just slowly builds and before you know it you have this like really incredible life that you couldn't have conceived of before. Um, I think what this points to is that um, there needs to be a lot more work done on thinking about what it is to be like practically identical to a future person. Um, because in some ways, this like gradual change resembles like your bodily change over time. So like, you know, seven years ago, it's completely different atoms that made you up. Similarly, like if you don't, you might be a person who thinks there's not like one specific feature that you really need, like that Russian 
socialist, but it might be a cluster of features that are essential to who you are. And like you can totally lose one of them as long as you don't lose all of them. And then it starts looking the same way. And like maybe then you've got to say something about whether this gradual change does result in like a complete transformation or it's okay as long as it's gradual. And it does seem if we adopt that view of transformation, then nobody won't be transformed. I mean, it's kind of, it seems like it's going to be the case in any life mm -hmm. that there will be that incremental uh, change, mm -hmm. potentially in any life, an incremental change in um, that cluster of things. Mm -hmm. um, so that transformation, if we allow it to be over long periods of time and incremental, might end up being true of any life. This is maybe right, and I think it also poses really interesting questions about like very practical aspects of our lives. So, for example, um, we make decisions now about like end of life care, uh, but it may turn out that like you change in such a like it could be really drastic, but it could just be slowly. And then like by the time you get to like the person at the end of the life, like they're in no sense related to like the person who made that initial decision. And then we've got to figure out what to do in this case. And I think this is like a thing that's fairly common. It's like the earlier person signed a DNR, but the later person like who can no longer like change that earlier DNR, um, no longer like would prefer to not have yeah. it, right? Um, and then there's like interesting practical questions about what we should do in those cases. Yeah. It seems like it seems based on the so the, the uh, reliance on uh, self interest as the main. Um, kind of reason that we're considering, um, that the, uh, the kind of anti-Pascalian argument that you're giving depends on, uh, it's re the relevance of the anti-Pascalian argument depends on uh, there being cases uh, where the um, practical, practical self-interest consideration is the all things considered sort of motivation. Mm -hmm. So that is to say, under if it's the case that that um, the rationality of any transformative change decision mm -hmm. is a rationality that's that's um, grounded in moral reasons or uh, other kinds of you know non self interest interested reasons, mm -hmm. then um, then questions of self interest then the, the decision won't turn on questions of self-interest and this won't be totally relevant. So that what I'm interested in is the question, are there any standard cases that get considered about parenting or religious conversion or whatever mm -hmm. that can really be construed as decisions for which um, there are no relevant, uh, there are no complications. Yeah. Right, that are mitigating. Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually think that several of them are, and usually the ones that are, are about interpersonal relationships. This is just like my own view, but here's why I think this. Um, when you're deciding whether or not to have children, it certainly couldn't be that you want to have children for the sake of someone else, because like, you know, no one else exists yet. Um, and this means like the only relevant people you could be considering are like you and like your partner or whoever. Uh, and in that case, I think self-interest is pretty important. Now, I know there are people who think, like, oh, you're, like, obligated to have children. I guess I'm just, like, not one of those people. If they're right, then, like, yeah, maybe this is a bad example. Well, you went to Notre Dame. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, another one, I no think, <laughs> is about, um, so I think that, like, choosing your friends or maybe choosing, like, who you want to spend your life with is another one of these types of changes because, like, look, there's never, like, an obligation to someone else that you, like, be their best friend or something like mm -hmm. this, right? Um, certainly, like, the only, like, people this could be about is, like, person this could be about is you. Uh, and I don't think, like, since you're not morally obligated to do it, uh, I think that, like, probably this is a case where, like, self-interest is really important. Um, but also where, like, that should not really be the driving factor. Um, it's, so it's sort of weird. But, yeah, I think, like, maybe interpersonal cases are pretty good ones. Um, Oh, the sense modality cases mm -hmm. usually are, um, I guess usually like, so I don't know if you, um, a lot of people who are born deaf can like have cochlear implants, which will give them, 
make them able to hear. But there's a very big controversy about whether or not this is actually in the self-interest of the person receiving the cochlear implants, because there are like very like enriching things about living in the deaf community that you can't like appreciate if you're hearing. Uh, and so it's like a little unclear like whether like we should say that's like better, right? Um, but like I think in that case, clearly the relevant thing is the self-interest. Like there's nothing else that could be like making it the case that we should or shouldn't give this person the cochlear implant. And then it's just like it is like a transformative case. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you gave some options to, to consider as to which direction one might wish to take um, in making rational, you know, mm -hmm. practically rational decisions mm -hmm. under these conditions. Mm -hmm. um, do you, what do you make of um, leap of faith type? I mean, uh, that, I mean that's, and that's not a question about leap of religious faith necessarily, mm -hmm. it's a, for any, of, any such case, that is to say, you well, what the heck? Not Let's give it a go. Because, um, <laughs> Even if it's irrational. Practice, yeah, that is to say, it's... apart from any projectability concerns mm -hmm. or considerations whatsoever, just to sort of, you know, given current preferences, mm -hmm. you know, let's just have a go. Um, do you think that in those cases that 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 kind of um, that kind of practical reasoning is irrational? It looks like there's sort of like two different possibilities. One is like if self-interested value is the only thing that matters, then in these, well actually, sorry, on the like model I'm pushing, it's like really bad to transform because like mm -hmm. you're disconnected from that person. Right. So the question is like, is there a way to like opt for transformation that's not completely irrational? And what this will require is like you being connected to the future person in the right sort of way. Um, and so one way that I've sort of explored is like being the relevant sort of way is that like you want to choose to become that person even if you don't fully like understand what it will be like. Um, and so like if there's something like that going on, that may be a good enough of a link to where it's not like you don't exist anymore, practically speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and this is different from like if you chose for a different reason, like self-interest, I think you'd be like in a lot of trouble there. Mm -hmm. Also, if it was just thrust upon you, I think that's bad also. But if you could, if there's some way of making the decision such that like you preserve the link between like who you are as an agent, so maybe by like choosing it because you want to become that person, that might be good enough. For now, please join me in thanking Dr. Chen.